there are two palm fronds that we can hold in life. So what I mean by that? There are the palm fronds which we can hold uh, as we do today, as those in our gospel, our first gospel at the beginning of uh, Mass, held before Jesus to look at him as a spectacle, perhaps looking um, and gathering around him so their neighbors knew that they were righteous, so they wouldn't be left behind or left out. That's one palm frond that we can hold. And for some people, we hold that by coming to Mass, not really believing in God or wanting to change our lives or wanting to worship, but just so people know we're good or so we can convince ourselves that we're good or whatever it might be. Maybe they're donuts or something. You know, no, they're not donuts, but um, maybe we do that by uh, putting up uh, the most recent cause, you know, on our Instagram or on a flag on our house or a sign, joining an organization or a club or aligning ourselves with a certain group of neighbors against another, whatever it might be. You know, in the end, this palm frond that we held in the first gospel where they all yelled Hosanna actually is one of no integrity. It is uh, simply um, not wanting to be caught out alone. It's for fear of uh, not being saved by yourself. It has nothing to do with God, in fact. Or we can hold uh, the palm frond of, of victory and it's covered right now, but you, there's a statue over there of Thomas More, St. Thomas More. He's a, a man who was put to death in the, the English Reformation, and he's holding a palm branch, you'll notice, when, you know, on next week when we uncover the statues. And it's the palm frond that is held in the imagery of the church by the martyrs. And what is a martyr? A martyr is someone who, even though they were alone, stood up for God stood up for Jesus and said that he, he died for me and I will live my life for that. And I will die for that. And so in the iconography of the church, whenever you see a palm frond, it is almost always being held by a martyr. In our gospel, we have these two types, these two groups of people. We have this first group who gathers around Jesus, Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. But as I said, they don't really care about the Lord. They, they just care about themselves. It's just coming to see a spectacle. We have Peter who denies the Lord. We have the other disciples who are nowhere to be found, in fact. Every single one of them. All of the people you'd expect to be gathered around Jesus in support are gone. And then we have all of the people that we would never have thought that would have gathered around the Lord. And they are the ones who are there. And so who do we have in our gospel? We have the centurion. What does it say here? If I can find it in our passage. I may not be able to find it here. But the centurion who looks out and attests that um, God is being glorified. And the church has named him as a saint. We call him Saint Longinus. And we say he is the saint that thrust his sword into the side of Christ. So imagine that. The soldier who thrusts his sword into the side of Christ is named a saint in the church. He has a statue in St. Peter's. Who else do we have? We have the good thief, the criminal who is being put to death, and rightfully so. He may have taken a life or been a part of rebellion. And he is hanging next to the Lord, and he calls out and he says, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Then we have Joseph of Arimathea who was part of the committee, the, the council that condemned Jesus to death, and yet he steps out alone 
in front of everyone, in the eyesight of everyone, and gives Jesus his tomb so that everyone would know that Joseph of Arimathea was a follower of Christ. And each of these are, are saints in our, in our faith. And I always like to say that the first saint is Dismas, the good thief. Imagine that. Because Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. So I think he's the first saint. Imagine that. The first saint is a condemned murderer. So, I don't want you to actually raise your hand for this, but in your mind, I want you to raise your hand. Raise your hand, in your mind, if you ever desire to murder anyone. Raise your hand if you wish you had been the one at the side of the, cro of the cross to thrust your spear into his side. Raise your hand if you wish you had been the one in the council that voted to condemn Jesus to death. And if you can't imagine yourself being one of those people, then it's going to be really hard for you to imagine yourself as being saved by Jesus Christ from your sins. This is the point of this gospel and of our faith. Pope Francis says it all the time, the saints have always said it, that Jesus came um, to, to save sinners. And if you can't put yourself in their shoes, then you're one of those palm frond holders in the, in the first. Just there to, to toot your own horn. You, you are a member of the self-righteous and um, there is no joy in heaven for you. But if you can come before the Lord and if you can say, I am a sinner, have mercy on me. I don't deserve you and yet here you are. And my actions have put you to death and my denials have made you alone at the cross. And I come before you today, Lord, and I say, have mercy on me. If you can do that, then you'll be saved. It's the message of our faith. It's the message of the gospel. And so I pray as we enter into these holy mysteries of Holy Week that we, um, especially, you know, through Saturday, not Saturday midday, we spend a little time in sorrow for our sins, our failures. And if you can, maybe even weep for them. So that way, you might actually be saved by the Lord. We pray that we might do that to know the glory of Easter.